Well, welcome everyone to our 2016 Covey Lecture Series. I'm Debbie Ingalls. I'm the director of the Cool Climate Enology and Viticulture Institute here at Brock University. Uh, and uh, I'd like to welcome everybody in our audience as well as our online uh, guests that are taking in the lecture today. Today, I'm uh, proud to present uh, a Covey Fellow, Tech Thong Papanel. Tech is a professor in the Goodman School of Business and is chair of their Department of Marketing, International Business and Strategy. He attained his PhD in management from the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in the United States. His research focus uh, currently is on wine business, technology and innovation management, and product innovation and strategic marketing management. So uh, a lot of uh, uh, great background to bring to our local grape and wine industry, as well as beyond to the Canadian industry. Tech is also part of a team of researchers currently looking at developing high quality sparkling wines with regional identity in Ontario, which is a program funded by OMAFRA. In 2016, he was awarded the prestigious University of Canterbury's Erskine Fellowship, uh, through which he will be traveling to New Zealand to deliver uh, teaching and research seminars. I may just have to go along with tech as a, as a, a chaperone for you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I mean, yes. yes. <laughs> well, there he hopes to do comparative work for his sparkling wine research to learn the differences between Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Today, Tech will be talking to us about supporting local wine in the presence of institutional adversity, looking at the critical roles of network embeddedness, innovation orientation, and market turbulence. So please join me in welcoming Tech this afternoon. Thank you, thank you Dave, for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, again, it's a pleasure to be presenting the work that we uh, at the Goodman School of Business did, and most of them are fellow, uh, Kobe fellow. Uh, in addition to myself, uh, Dr. De Klerk and Dr. Voronov are also part of this research study. And again, the title of the research study is Supporting Local Wine in the Presence of Market Turbulence and Institu Institutional Adversity. Now, I'd like to give a lot of backdrop. You know, sometimes it's difficult for us to conduct uh, wine related or hotel related or, you know, basically an industry specific type study and trying to basically publish it in the mainstream uh, management or business uh, journals. So you always have to come to the local problem through a general theories. So what we did when we looking at this uh, particular study in terms of supporting local wine, which we already published one paper uh, uh, a couple of years back, we're looking at every company, whether or not it's going to be winery, restaurant, they also have to do market orientation. They have to focus on how they could be best at serving customer and provide value to the customer or the buyers. Okay. They also have to be very entrepreneurial in terms of what they come up with in strategy, in tactics, and in approach to running and making money. So the difficulty sometimes is for firm and for company and for restaurant to be both market oriented as well as entrepreneurial oriented. And especially in supporting local wine, it's even, be, it even uh, become more complicated because as we know, sustainability and buying local product usually don't yield short-term result, but rather long-term result. Some of the benefit cannot be account through the dollar amount currently, but in future revenue. Right? So that's the issue that we are dealing with. Right? So what we are doing now when we're looking at you know, uh, market orientation in terms of serving customer better, in terms of responding and uh, competing with our competitor, and in terms of branding our organization, meaning the interfunctional coordination so that we can you know, achieve all these on entrepreneurial uh, oriented type activities such as taking risks, being innovative, uh, being proactive in going after new market and also respond to our competitor in a, an aggressive fashion. The setting that we are in, right, I'm happy to report though that when I first started this research project probably four or five years ago, not many Ontario uh, restaurants do offer and list Ontario wine on their wine list. Now it's getting better, 
but it's still not there yet. And I will explain to you at the end of the presentation what I think could be done in order to promote local and Ontario wide even more. Okay. So at the backdrop, we have this issue of, you know, customer doesn't like or doesn't know enough about Ontario wine. So they hesitate to buy it. So when they hesitate to buy it, member of the supply chain, including the restauranter, because in Ontario, we have LCBO as the main distributor or the only distributor. So the other channel would be restauranter that actually put Ontario wine on their wine list or buy and then sell Ontario wine at their restaurant. When customers don't ask for it and when customers don't know enough about it, then they don't want to put the wine on the wine list, which in the end limits the ability for winery to sell product to the customer and grow the area, grow the, uh, grow the, grow the segment. So we term this, we call this condition as the institutional adversity you know, where we refer to this condition marked by the limited institutional support for sustainable practices from customer and from other stakeholders as institutional adversity, such that the firm must engage in sustainable behavior in the absence of either market or normative demand, meaning customer don't want it, so member of the supply chain don't want it. Now again, like I said, it's getting better, but I think it could be even better in terms of growing the Ontario uh, segment and Canadian segment in general. What do we look at in this research? Okay. And uh, we're looking at, and, and I will explain to you why I'm looking at this construct, the market turbulence. Why do I look at the network embeddedness? Why do I look at innovative orientation? And in the end, the main construct that we are trying to go after is the sustainable behavior where we try to see whether cus the customer, we try to see whether the supply chain member, in this case, the res restauranter, actually support, you know, going uh, for green initiative, buying local product, try to reduce carbon footprint in their practices. Right? The reason we're looking at market turbulence because that's the context of the industry also. In the restaurant industry, you always have new restaurant coming in, replacing an old one. And the third, the, the, the so-called the, the rate that restaurant come and go is very high. Right? So you always have new restaurant coming in and you will have you always have a lot of restaurants year, year in and year out going out of business right? and being replaced by the newer one. And some restaurants even have to do something with themselves in order to uh, renew what the restaurant is to the customer. Okay? Network embeddedness. We consider the extent to which firm develop a strong form, formal and informal relationship with network partner. And this, the reason we add this, because in our previous study that we already published, we find that restauranter or restaurant owners and people who actually make an, uh, the decision on what why to put on their wine list actually support local wine when they have access to the people, meaning they have the social capital they are also more likely to buy and to choose Ontario wine to be on their wine list when they have more human capital, meaning they have knowledge about the wine that they are selling. They know the winery owner, they know the people at the, at the boutique, and they have been visiting and talking to people, so they're very embedded in that network of either human capital as well as social capital. We also see a lot of things that we, the industry, are trying to do here locally. I mean, Ontario is young, con con comparatively speaking, to other uh, Y region in the world, you know. But we use the benefit of being young to try to experiment and always coming up with new product and always trying to be innovative in the process that we do things around here. So I think. These together serve as a good combination of variable that when we look at it through our theoretical and conceptual models, it turned out that we find some interesting result, you know, when we put them, uh, them in the model and then try to understand the relationship that we have amongst these variables. So, simple pictures, right? We have network embeddedness serve as the main resources that uh, restaurant owner or restauranter actually used to trying to get to the sustain sustainable behavior, but at the outset, right, market turbulence 
the frequent chain of customer demand, the frequent chain of you know who are your direct and indirect competitor, the frequent changes in terms of technology, actually it's a good thing. And I will explain to you similar to what I used to explain my student in my uh, new product development class. If you want to create something new, you want to be the first to get into either the market or the application or the technology domain that is too uncertain and ambiguous. If you go into the market that is already certain, everything can be planned, then it's, very less, uh, it's less likely that you're going to be able to come out on top and be the most important and the most successful player in that market. The more established the market, the less likely that you're going to be able to break into it, simply put. So, in this case, we're looking at market turbulence in the context that we have defined earlier, right? And the extent that firm competitive market conditions are characterized by frequent changes in technology, customer demand, competitor, competitor uh, responses, right? And we believe that when things are unclear, when things are unclear, meaning, you know, we don't know yet whether a customer will like the product that you are trying to introduce to them when things are unclear yet who gonna be competing directly with you if you were to make some new why and then you know a uh, new blend of why and then were to label it using your your old label this year then it offer you opportunity to rather than focusing on short term and today it give you room for you to maneuver and to be able to react and respond to competitive uh, uh, pressure Okay. And again, the context of this study is when we're looking at this study, we use the restaurant as the subject of the survey. We also believe that the innovative orientation, meaning how well you are at you know, being creative and use, using a new approach to try to make use of the network that you have, and also how well you are in using the network that you have to try to pursue the sustainable behavior. In the end, help make that uh, connection, the main connection between market turbulence, network embeddedness, and sustainable behavior even stronger. So innovation is good, you know, and we know that innovation is good, but in this, in this setting, we know specifically that innovation is good because it allows you to get more from the position that you are in to be able to tap into different uh, human capital as well as social capital through the network embeddedness. The innovative orientation or innovation help you getting what you have in terms of social capital and human capital towards sustainable behavior. And also, uh, there's a direct uh, relationship between the uncertainty that you have right, as a backdrop of your operation and your ability to think long term rather than short term. This is very and this is very counterintuitive, right? You know, people would think that when you are under pressure and when you are under the situation of uncertainty, then you should go for the sure thing, right? which is true in, in, in many contexts, but in the context where you have a lot of people competing and people really don't know what they are competing for. You can think of it that way. We, we really don't know what they are competing for. In the end, it allows you to, again, be more future looking and go after future dollar rather than uh, trying to maximize your current stream of revenue. We sample uh, 1,000 restaurants using the list or the database that we received from the Alcohol and Gaming Commission of Ontario. So out of the 1,000 uh, survey that we sent out or we reached out to the people, we received about 250 back and we actually eliminate some missing data and incomplete survey and in the end we use 250 uh, Ontario based restaurants to actually analyze this model. I also show in this diagram the sample sample item that more or less represent the variable that we address. For example, market turbulence, we have one of the items uh, being our customer regularly ask for new product and services. And again, all of this construct, all of this variable, I, I, uh, when we did capture it, we use multi uh, item uh, measure to capture it. So these are just an example of one of the item in each of the construct. So innovative orientation in general, I'm among the first in my circle of friends to purchase a new why. Okay. Network embeddedness, I maintain personal close contact with external partners such as Winery, LCBO, Writer, and Wine Testing events. In terms of sustainable behavior, we're looking at, I try to source goods and ingredients that leave a small environmental footprint. And when we run this model using multi-item 
uh, scales to capture each of these variable. The model uh, is a good fit and also the relationship as highlighted in red here are all significant at a different degree. Right? The strongest one is probably the, the relationship going from network embeddedness to sustainable behavior. Right? And then you can also see that there's also a strong direct relationship between market turbulence and sustainable behavior. But you see the effect of uh, innovative orientation that serve as a moderator in this model. When we did this and when we go to the peer review process, then we always have to control the model in order for us to be able to generalize the finding to other contexts. So what we did uh, when we analyze this is we actually control for the restaurant age and also the size, the average uh, price per meal, and also the presence of testing menu, whether they have one or not and whether the restaurant are part of a chain because we try to exclude restaurant chain right? you know like Swiss chalet because some of the people participating were from Swiss chalet but they're part of the restaurant chain so we want to see whether or not this finding or this significant relationship more or less uh, play out in a similar fashion when we're dealing with both you know restaurants that have testing menu and not restaurants that have uh, all part of the uh, chain or uh, an independently owned uh, restaurant so what we found it it shouldn't be something totally new we found that in order for you to go after sustainability or you know supporting local wide uh, going after a uh, green and initiative, uh, something that would reduce the carbon footprint, we found that the relationship that you have with the member of the industry help you tap into uh, social apps and also human capital that allow you to do more with what you have. We also acknowledge the importance of being innovative because innovative uh, basically allow you to get to, if you want to simplify it, allow you to get to good friends and friend with benefit. And then it also innovative, also allow you to get whatever you have from your friend and make use of it. Okay. So this is the, the simplicity of what we find. But if you were to think about it, in a sense, it's not very simple okay, because it go against the, the notion that when it's uncertain, let's focus on the present, but not going after the future or going after sustainability. Because sustainability in the short term, you always have to pay more to be sustainable and you always get less if you were to have a shorter window when you, when you look at you know, uh, profitability uh, aspect of your operation. Okay. Now, I mentioned at the outset that you know now we're getting better because now Ontario restaurant place more Ontario wine onto the wine list. But what I have not yet talked about, and I promise you that I will talk about at the end of the presentation, is to me personally the, the big problem is when you're dealing with good product and you cannot sell good product. There are some wide region in the world, and I shall not name it, them, them, that have not yet matured to make good wine, at least to my taste. But we making good wine, so why can't we sell more of our good wine? That's, that's to me, that's a big no-no. When you have good product, why can't you sell good product? There is no longer a problem of production, it's a problem of marketing or management. Or you're not doing something right in the marketplace in order to sell more of your good product. So, when I go to restaurants, sometimes I see that the why by the class, right? Why by the class? So I think when we did this study, we only look at whether or not you have Ontario why included in your why list, and what is the percentage or the proportion of Ontario why that you put on your why list. I think it would be more interesting for future study to looking at the effect whether or not if you were to allow customer to test. Ontario wide by the class. And again, from the marketing standpoint, we can easily do this. We can basically incentivize all the restaurants to basically say, you know, if you basically offer our wide by the class to our customer and serve as the extended boutique to our customer, right? Because until, this is another problem, until they test the wine, they're not going to be able to say they like or dislike it. 
and they will not test it until they you know some some people or often time most people who don't have enough knowledge about the wine industry they will not test it until they heard it from their friend who have tested it or they have read it somewhere from the wine critic or they have been you know talking about it or they have come across it online right so the in in product innovation we call the difference between coefficient of innovation meaning somebody trying it out for the first time or coefficient of imitation somebody trying it because they learn about it from some other channel through their friend family member and network of their you know uh, people in their social network why is different than other product is not technology product is an experiencing product so you never gonna have a high coefficient of innovation meaning somebody buying the product for the first time without trying it why is always the product that you have to maximize or try to optimize get as high as possible the coefficient of imitation so this is another thing that i would suggest based on at least this research and and future research could also test out this hypothesis right, in terms of offering the wine by the classes in order to get more people to try and uh, sample your wine. And I was thinking because, you know, when we do academic research, we always come up with a long title, long title and sometimes boring and sometimes we try to put in words that people don't understand to make ourselves look sophisticated. So in this case, I try to simplify it. So if I were to label this and if I were to have, you know, like a, a, a small talk with someone about this research, I would change the title to unpredictability, creativity and innovation. Because this is almost like cooking. When you have these three ingredients together, guess what? Member of your supply chain, people who be, who will be promoting and selling your wine, going to be more likely to help you sell your product. Now. From the marketing standpoint, you have to understand this survey, we did it with restaurant owner. Okay? So we didn't do it with winery owner or people working in the winery. But what can we do with this? What we can do is we already learned that the restaurant owner or the restauranter will put more of the local wine on the wine list if they have a good network of people. So try to connect with them try to be their friend, I mean, genuinely be their friend in terms of providing them with the latest information about your wine. Trying to, you know, exchange information on a regular basis. Right? And also trying to suggest to them because we, as the people who are producing product, should be suggesting to the people who are reselling it and people who are using it on how they can get the most from the product. So this is what, you know, uh, if we were to extend this to the people who are producing and selling why that would be my my so-called practical implication above and beyond this and again future research will be able to test this out and uh, tease it out further whether or not this uh, recommendation or this implication would also work any questions yes Some questions. Um, thanks that was a, that's a really uh, exciting and interesting uh, area of research that uh, that you're working on but it, um, it just struck me as I'm listening to you, there's a, a huge movement uh, for local produce. You know, restaurants really promoting that as part of their, uh, what they're offering to their customer base. But it just seems to fall short to extend that to local wines. So local produce, yes, yes, you, know, you go into more and more restaurants today and you're highlighting local seasonal produce and, uh, you know, whether it's in the winter, winter vegetables, summer, you know, fruit, they're, they're always promoting the local products. What's the, the barrier from the restaurant owner's perspective of why they don't extend that to wines? Is it that the wineries just maybe don't have the, the funding, the capacity to go out and make that one-on-one -on -one connection? with the winery owner, with the restaurant owners, so they're not building that relationship. Is that the... I, I don't think it's a barrier that uh, the restaurant owner or the winery don't make connection with restaurant. I don't think it's the barrier because one-on-one, on one-to-one -on -one, on -one -one connection nowadays is so easy. Right? It's so easy for you to just drop somebody an email. So easy for you to even lie somebody who, you know, you, whom you met at the local uh, wine uh, events. It's easy, but this is another thing. And, uh, 
When I first came here, what I like about the Ontario wine industry is we, as the industry, rather than promoting our own wine, we promote the industry. So when we promote the industry, we lift the industry up at the same time. And we still do now. I mean, I see people that advocate the Ontario wine to their customer, meaning if they come to your boutique and they couldn't find something that they like, because the people at the boutique is experienced enough and knowledgeable enough and have enough human capital about the network that they are in, so-called the wine network. So they know what wine the customer may like and should go next in terms of visiting. Okay? And I think now we have less of that. And I think the, the way going forward is to right now to support the industry. And I can understand, and this almost link back to this study. Usually when we get to a certain level, when people start seeing the market segment clearly defined, and this is the, the, the issue, I think, when people start clearly seeing all the segment being defined, then they start saying, ah, now I know how I should position my product in this segment against my competitor. So you heavily focus your interaction with the customer or people who can help you promote and sell why by focusing on product differentiation, the difference between your and somebody else's product, rather than promoting the Ontario Y product together. Okay? And I don't know about you, when you're dealing with experienced product, the thing that I often tell my students is I love drinking Pinot Noir, but I still cannot drink Pinot Noir every day. Okay? And sometimes I'm Blend it up. I mix Kame, Try to confuse myself. Right? Right? So that's that's what that's what customer are when we dealing with experience. Right? Even if you like oatmeal, you cannot eat oatmeal every day. Right? So as an industry, I think if we were to go back to almost the the initiative or the approach that the industry used about five to ten years ago, right? In terms of promoting and uplifting the entire industry, I think it would it would do better. And you can see this happening in you know other uh, so-called locally products like produce, uh, local meat, local farmer, right? right? They work as an industry, right? Local cheese, right? They work as an industry rather than uh, trying to say my cheese or my tomato or my blueberry is better than you, by better than yours, right? So that I think that's. But again, this is more complicated than 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 my answer uh, suggests, but. If you were to ask me for my, my opinion, that would be my opinion. Yeah. Question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it seems like I mean, this is a, a really well supported model when you're talking about individual firms and individual restaurants. I wonder if there is problems or um, implications then that go industry wide so that the model might be able to be applied to the embeddedness of the wine industry to the restaurant industry mm -hmm. as opposed to its competitors other spirits, other industries, and other, other wine regions in the world. So take that model one step higher for industry marketing boards, industry marketing associations, and their embeddedness within, say, restaurant associations, restaurant boards. Some, some part of it, some relationship may still work, but I question or I'm uncertain yet whether or not all the relationship will work. Because when you aggregate the individual level to the group or the industry level, Usually, there are other intervening variables that may prevent certain mechanism that you found at the individual level to work. So I am cautiously uh, would have to say no at this point until we actually test it at the industry level. Yeah. And when you group it together at the industry level, then again, you are trying to compete from the customer buying power, meaning the dollar. You are still trying to also compete for customer consumption power, meaning how many glasses of alcohol they can drink a week or a day. Okay? And they have and now you're looking at whiskey industry. Now you're looking at the you know the surge and now you know more or less plateau out of the mixed drink and cocktail industry. Right? So even though we are still categorized under uh, beverages uh, industry, when you break it down to why versus other spirit, it's more complicated than that, I think, because we're competing for the same dollars and we're competing for the same people who either have to choose between drinking something and something else. Yeah, so I don't know yet until we test it, but yeah, that's a good, that's a good thing to do, I guess.
comparing different industry and see what happened. Yeah. Other questions? Please join me in thanking Matt Tech for stimulating talks. Uh, oh, and I forgot the Cork USB key, so I'll have to get that to you. Uh, this is one, one more part of your uh, present there. Um, next week, our 2016 lecture series uh, will come to an end, uh, but our last speaker is another Covey Fellow, Ron Jackson, uh, who's the author of the infamous Wine Science uh, book that I know many of you in the room uh, have used and referenced. Uh, and next week he'll be uh, talking to us uh, uh, looking at oak characteristics relative to barrel production. So I look forward to seeing you all here uh, next week.